are in cardiovascular. So cardiovascular acute responses refer to changes in the cardiovascular system, which occur as a result of physical activity. These changes occur in the heart and blood vessels around the body, and they generally aim to get more blood and therefore more oxygen to the working muscles, allowing more ATP to be produced aerobically. Cardiovascular, if you just think cardio means heart, vascular means like vessels, blood vessels. So cardiovascular acute responses refer to small responses in response to exercise which affect the heart and the vessels, the blood systems. Okay, so that kind of helps me to remember it. So once again, looking up the etymology of words um, might help you to like remember what these words mean. So one of our main cardiovascular acute responses, like if you imagine going out running, what's the first thing you're going to notice? Probably that you're out of breath. Second thing is probably your increased heart rate. You'll feel your blood pumping, right? You'll start to like be more flush because your blood's pumping harder. Stuff like that. So increased heart rate is an increased, sorry, is a cardiovascular acute response to exercise. What is heart rate? It's the amount of time the heart beats per minute. So it's taken in beats per minute. Um, I give you a bunch of formulas all throughout these lectures. Um, if you come to them throughout the year, I'll give you a bunch more formulas too. But yeah, we don't need to know all of these formulas really. Um, like you don't have to calculate anything on the exam except for this one formula here. And this is our maximum heart rate. So the maximum heart rate of an athlete is equal to 220 take away their age. So I'm 21, so 220 take my age, 220 take 21. Um, you guys should figure that out. So you're not allowed to calculate on the exam. I'll give you really simplistic calculations like 220 take age, stuff like that. Um, but this is the only the only formula, the only calculation you need to know to do. And it's come up in the exam before. So, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, if you're like 18, do 20 to 18, your maximum heart rate is going to be something like 202 beats per minute, approximately. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, by increasing heart rate, more blood is able to be circulated around the body, which makes sense. What's the point of our heart? Like, it beats, right? It beats to pump blood around the body. Why do we need blood going around the body? Because that blood brings with it nutrients and oxygen. So we can actually deliver that oxygen to the working muscles. As such, we can actually produce more ATP aerobically as opposed to anaerobically. In doing this, what we do is we actually increase the amount of reliance on the aerobic system as opposed to the anaerobic glycolysis system or the, anaerobic, or the ATPPC system. Why don't we really like the anaerobic systems? Well, because they cause fatigue, remember. They actually result in the production of metabolic fatiguing byproducts because that uh, carbohydrate is broken in from glycogen into glucose into pyruvic acid. Because we're working anaerobically, that pyruvic acid is going to be broken down into lactic acid and hence lactate and also produce those metabolic fatiguing byproducts, hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions actually are going to interfere with the acidity of the muscles and cause fatigue. And so that's really not good for us. Causing fatigue is not going to be conducive to your exercise. And so we really want to avoid that as much as possible. Hence, you can see that increased heart rate is an effective measure at kind of circumventing that. Okay? That was kind of a long spiel. Um, just going on about increased heart rate, more blood, more oxygen, more reliance on aerobic system, less reliance on anaerobic system. And it's kind of a tedious thing because I'm going to go through it like 10 more times throughout this lecture today. But it's going to be something that comes up in your exam. You need to be able to say something like that or to that effect on your own paper. Because it might be something worth 8 marks where they ask you to discuss why we want these cardiovascular acute responses to occur or respiratory acute responses to occur. Like what is the point of them? Essentially to get more oxygen to your working muscles so that you actually rely more heavily on the aerobic system as opposed to the anaerobic system. Okay, so you really want to keep that stuff in mind. Um, there's a direct linear relationship between exercise intensity and heart rate. Hopefully you'll like recognize this. You run harder, your heart rate increases. And it increases to about a maximal rate of 220 take away your age. Okay? <clears throat> um, stroke volume is another cardiovascular acute response. So it's the amount of blood that leaves the left ventricle of the heart per beat. Uh, left ventricle is really important because it's the chamber of heart at which the blood like leaves and enters the bloodstream. So you do need to know that left ventricle of the heart for stroke volume. Oh, I know it's really itchy. 
Through increasing stroke volume, more blood and oxygen is able to be circulated around the body and therefore more oxygen is able to be delivered to the working muscles. So if you just think about it, the amount of blood that leaves the left ventricle of the heart per beat, if you increase the amount of blood that leaves, you increase the amount of oxygen which also leaves, therefore you've got more oxygen going to the working muscles, therefore you've got increased reliance on the aerobic system as opposed to the anaerobic system, therefore less production of metabolic fatiguing byproducts, particularly the hydrogen ions which are associated with lactate which are a byproduct of the anaerobic system, and therefore you've got less fatigue being produced. So that's why we want more aerobic reliance, okay? Very repetitive. Um, another formula we do need to memorize here, increased cardiac output. Cardiac output's also run down as Q, um, and its formula is Q equals SV times HR. So it's actually a product of heart rate and stroke volume multiplied by one another. What is cardiac output? It's the total amount of blood that leaves left ventricle per minute. So you can see it combines those two previous formulas. Heart rate, which is beats per minute, and stroke volume, which is the amount of blood which leaves the left ventricle. So, ultimately, cardiac output is the total amount of blood that leaves the left ventricle per minute. It's a product of heart rate and stroke volume. So, an increase in heart rate, or, or and, um, and or, um, an increase in stroke volume are going to result in an increase in cardiac output. An increase in cardiac output means that more blood is circulated around the body and more oxygen is able to be delivered to the working muscles allowing more ATP to be produced aerobically, okay? So ultimately you can either increase either stroke volume or heart rate and this will increase cardiac output also. What does this do? This increases the total amount of blood that leaves the left ventricle per minute. Therefore, we've got increased oxygen going to our working muscles. Therefore, we've got increased reliance on the aerobic system as opposed to the anaerobic system. Um, therefore, less reliance on the anaerobic glycosis system means less production of metabolic fatigue byproducts such as uh, lactic acid and its associated hydrogen ions which cause fatigue therefore we've got less fatigue and more effective exercise um, or energy production without the cause of fatigue okay i know it's repetitive and i'm going to keep saying it but you have to know this and you have to be able to write something to that effect for the exam i feel like i'm actually just saying the same thing over and over again sorry i know it's annoying but this will hopefully help you for the exam Another cardiovascular acute response is increased blood pressure. Um, so exercise results in an increase in systolic blood pressure. Uh, you don't need to know too much about systolic versus diastolic, but the definitions are here anyway. So systolic blood pressure is the pressure in the arteries after the blood's been pumped out of the heart. Diastolic blood pressure is the pressure in the arteries when the blood has returned to the heart for the next beat. I'm trying to remember my mnemonic for it. I made up in like first or second year of uni. Um, okay, systolic, I remember now. So systolic, I think of systolic being the blood pressure after the heart's been squeezed. So if you squeeze the heart, right, like you've just shoved all the blood out of it. So it's squeezed out. Systolic squeeze, just think SS. Diastolic, I just think dead. Like if you're dead, like you're like resting, right? It's like a resting blood like there's no pressure being applied there it's just the, the blood pressure in the in the arteries when the blood returned to the heart for the next beat so i don't think you really have to know that anyway um but if you do buy a med or something like that later on that may be useful to know ultimately um increased blood pressure um is useful as a cardiovascular acute response because it means more blood gets to the areas we need therefore more oxygen gets to the areas we need Therefore, we've got increased reliance on the aerobic system as opposed to the anaerobic systems. Therefore, less production of metabolic fatigue byproducts, such as the hydrogen ions associated with lactic acid, which lead to increased acidity in the muscles and cause fatigue. So, once again, it's good to be producing more energy aerobically. <clears throat> we've got something called increased venous return. So it's really important that any increase in cardiac output is matched by an increase in venous return of the blood to the heart. So cardiac output, remember, has a formula of stroke volume times by heart rate. We actually need to return this blood back to the heart, and we actually return blood back to the heart via the veins. And these are a network of vessels um, which return blood back to the heart, and there are three main mechanisms. Oops, I can go to the next page. Um, yeah, so... Veins have valves, they return blood back to the heart. It's really important. If you just imagine you're pumping blood out of your heart and it's not returning, like 
you don't have any more blood going to the lungs and circulating around your body. So we need venous return. We need to return that blood back to the heart. Otherwise, that blood's just going to pool somewhere and never come back. Like, you don't even really think about this until you study it. But, yeah, we need to ensure that that blood returns back to the heart. There are three main mechanisms. One of them is vasoconstriction. And so veins can constrict, and this forces the blood to move towards the heart. Okay, so veins kind of like stiffen a little bit, and that forces the blood to go back toward the heart. Uh, another one of the mechanisms is called the muscle pump, or the skeletal muscle pump. Um, <clears throat> if you're sitting here watching this lecture right now, I want you to kind of like raise one foot, like on your tiptoe. So stand on tiptoe on one foot, okay? You can feel the muscles in the back of your calves contracting together. I have not done my anatomy homework, so I can't tell you what muscles they are, but lifting your leg up, you can feel these muscles contract, right? They, they get taut and tight. So what happens is that when muscles contract, veins are squished together. So lifting your leg up to stand on tiptoe there is squishing your vein. This actually forces the blood inside of that vein to flow back toward the heart. Within the veins, there are one-way valves to prevent the blood from flowing back down towards the muscle and continue forward towards the heart. So lift your leg up, constrict it with those muscles, forces the blood to go back toward the heart. There are veins which kind of shut behind it, and so there's no backflow. And so the veins are forcing the blood to go all the way back to the heart. <clears throat> I've got another mechanism which can return blood back to the heart via the veins, and this is known as the respiratory pump. So when you breathe in, the diagram actually increases pressure in the abdominal area. So you've got an increase of pressure in the abdominal area, and this forces the veins there to be emptied towards the heart. So these different pressure gradients contribute to blood flowing back to the heart. And so when you breathe out again, the pressure is released and the veins fill with blood again. So continually breathing actually activates the respiratory pump and helps return blood back to the heart via the veins. Um, I feel like this is quite a forgettable part of PE these three mechanisms of venous return, you do need to know them for your exam. Like you need to be really quite well versed in them and be able to discuss them quite easily. So do be aware, respiratory pump refers to the diaphragm, increasing pressure in the abdomen, forcing blood to return um, back towards the heart via the veins. The skeletal muscle pump or the muscle pump is when you constrict your muscles and it forces the blood in the veins um, to be forced back to the heart because it squishes the veins. The veins are one-way valves, they get squished, blood falls upward, veins shut behind them, and so the blood must go back to the heart. And the last one which is the veins constricting, so vasoconstriction or vein constriction. Veins constrict or stiffen up a little bit, and this forces the blood to move back toward the heart. How are we going for time? Cool, we're going good. We've got plenty of time. Um, decreased blood volume. So during physical activity, the volume of our blood or the amount of blood actually decreases. Okay? So while more blood is being pumped around our body every minute, some of the plasma in our blood is actually lost to sweat, and this results in decreased blood volume. So I'll just try and break this down a bit more. Um, I don't know, for a really long time, I was just like, yeah, blood's red. It's just red blood cells. But blood is made up of a bunch of stuff. So, um, there are red blood cells, white blood cells, and blood. And also um, plasma, which is like a fluid, a fatty fluid type stuff. So during physical activity, when our body is overheating, we need to cool down. So I've already mentioned this before, but our blood will redirect blood flow toward our skin. And so what happens is that you've got some vasoconstriction, um, vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And so you'll have dilation of blood vessels going towards your skin. What this means is that they get bigger. The way I remember constriction and um, dilation, I just think a boa constrictor snake will constrict around an animal to try and digest it. So wrap up really tight because it gets smaller. Um, and that's how I remember that constriction is getting smaller, whereas dilation, the other one is getting bigger. Um, hopefully that helps someone out. Um, so I am so thirsty. So, while more blood is being pumped out of the body, we need... We need to actually get rid of some of that. Not get, We don't want to get rid of it, actually, but we want to cool our body down. And so we redirect some blood toward our skin. And so we have vasodilation toward our skin, vasoconstriction everywhere else. This means more blood goes toward our skin, it gets to our skin, and then it undergoes um, evaporation. So it evaporates, and this allows some of our um, 
plasma to actually be lost as sweat. And so this actually cools down our body. This evaporation process cools down our body. However, it does result in a decreased blood volume. So this is a cardiovascular acute response. I mentioned before that cardiovascular acute responses refer to the heart and the vessels. Blood is the main fluid which travels in these vessels, um, the cardiovascular vessels. And so this is why this is a cardiovascular acute response. So decreased blood volume. Anything relating to blood is um, a cardiovascular acute response. Okay, this is kind of a hard one to explain. So you've got something called an increased AVO2 difference. What does this stand for? Arterial venial oxygen difference, also known as AVO2 difference or AVO2 diff. And this is a difference in the concentration of oxygen in the arterioles, which transport blood to the muscles, compared to the venules, which transport blood away from the muscles. Therefore, it shows how much oxygen is actually being extracted from the blood and being used by the muscles. When the body is performing physical activity, AVO2 difference will increase as the muscle will be demanding more oxygen as it allows more ATP to be produced aerobically. Okay, that's a good diagram, but I'm going to draw one first. I'm just conscious about time. Yeah, we are fine. I just stopped freaking out about that. Here we have a heart. I don't know why this chamber is a lot bigger than this one. It's not a better heart. Balance. It's not a, an anatomically good, anatomically accurate heart, or even a symbolically accurate looking one. But anyway, blood leaves your heart. Um, if you know what vessel blood leaves your heart by, I'd be really happy. If you don't, now's the time to memorize it because it's important for your exam. Blood leaves your heart via arteries and arterioles. Arteries and arterioles. And it goes off to capillaries, where it will be diffused out into the working muscles. So from the capillaries, it enters the working muscles. It returns back to your heart via veins and venules. Okay, so blood leaves your heart. Oxygenated blood leaves your heart and enters arteries and arterioles. It then goes off to the capillaries. From the capillaries, it then is diffused into the working muscles. So that blood enters the working muscles, or that oxygen from that blood enters the working muscles. At the working muscles, you also have, um, you know, blood being used, the oxygen is extracted, and you've got carbon dioxide being kind of swapped here. So carbon dioxide is substituted out, and it enters... <coughs> um, so carbon dioxide and oxygen kind of swap places. So oxygen leaves here, enters the muscles, carbon dioxide enters here and enters the veins and the venules and then goes back to the heart, okay? So, I'm going to say it again, blood leaves the heart via the arteries and arterioles and returns back to the heart via veins and venules. As I mentioned before, we've got those three mechanisms of venous return, skeletal muscle pump, the respiratory pump and vasoconstriction. This is a hard thing to explain. When your blood leaves your heart, right, here, it's full of oxygen. It is full of oxygen. It's like, yes, lots of O2. Here, this is where you've got the swapping of oxygen. So the oxygen leaves the bloodstream here and enters the muscles. Here onwards, there's no oxygen left, hopefully, or a little bit of oxygen left, because most of that oxygen is being extracted from the blood. We don't want oxygen just travel around the body for no reason. We want to extract it here to use it in our working muscles, right? We want to use up this oxygen in order to facilitate aerobic respiration in order to facilitate the use of the aerobic system to produce energy. So we want to use that oxygen to rebuild ADP into ATP, okay? So it's really important that we want to get as much oxygen as possible. So hopefully, you know, here we've got lots of oxygen, here we've got most of the oxygen extracted out. So what is AVO2 difference? This is if you measured a bunch of the blood here in the artery and a bunch of blood here in the venule and compared how much oxygen is there, like you've got your blood, which is fine, but you want to see that there is a lot less oxygen here than there is here. Did you expect, you'd hopefully expect that a lot of that oxygen has been extracted here. Therefore, you've got barely any oxygen left in the blood here. Does that make sense? So, hopefully all of that oxygen has been extracted here and you've only got a little bit or a tiny little bit or just even none left here. And so you've got the most efficient extraction of oxygen here, which means that a lot of oxygen has been extracted from the blood efficiently and taken to the working muscles where it will facilitate um, 
uh, or it will facilitate uh, respiration or aerobic energy production. So hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> so I'm going to use this diagram. Here we've got arterioles and here we've got venules. This is kind of like the other side of our diagram. It's like looking at this part here. Artery and venule with the capillary in the middle and the muscles there. So your arterioles are oxygen rich blood. They should have quite a lot of oxygen in them. And you can see that this arterial here has 20 mils of oxygen per 100 mils of blood. Then it goes off and there's a capillary here where it diffuses into the working muscles. Okay, so the working muscles here. Then you've got the venules on the other side. Okay, artery, capillary, venule. <clears throat> you can see in this venule, you've actually got a blood oxygen concentration of 10 mils of oxygen per 100 mils of blood. So you can see you've actually got an arterial venule oxygen difference of 20 take away 10 out of 100 mils. And this means we've actually got 10 mils of oxygen per 100 mils of blood being extracted. That's what your AV2 difference is. It's pretty much the difference in oxygen present in blood in the arteries as compared to the veins and venules. Okay, so you're really just kind of looking at the difference in blood in these different vessels. And the reason why we look at it is because it kind of tells you how efficient your body is at extracting the oxygen it needs in order to facilitate aerobic exercise. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, maybe put a question in the chat and I will get back to you on it. Because um, I know it's quite a tricky concept and it is quite important to you to understand. Cool. <clears throat> Another cardiovascular acute response is blood redistribution. So during physical activity, blood is redirected from elsewhere in the body such as the organs, towards the working muscles. And this actually results in the working muscles receiving a higher percentage of the body's blood than they would during rest, which results in more oxygen being delivered to the working muscles. So when you're resting right now, you might have just eaten dinner maybe, or breakfast, or lunch, or I'm not sure what time it is for you that you're watching this, but you might have just eaten. And so a lot of blood is being directed from all over your body, and it's going to your stomach or your gut, right? And this is helping... To facilitate the digestion of your food and so it's redirected there when you start physical activity however the blood is redirected from your gut or whatever and it's going toward your working muscles and so a lot more blood is going to your working muscles like in your legs or your arms to help you run and this is like an evolutionary trait or adaptation um, so if you are suddenly being hunted by a lion or something your body doesn't need to digest right this very minute that's like very low on the priority list what is high on the priority list is getting lots of oxygen to your working muscles because it means that we'll have more oxygen going to the working muscles and therefore more reliance on the aerobic energy system as opposed to the anaerobic energy system. Therefore, we've got less production of those metabolic fatigue byproducts such as hydrogen ions, which are associated with lactic acid, um, which is produced um, as a result of anaerobic glycolysis. And consequently, you've got increased reliance on the aerobic system and therefore less production of those fatiguing byproducts. Therefore, more effective running. Um, so that's why we do want that aerobic system being most predominant supplier of energy. So yeah, um, that blood is redirected from elsewhere in the body because your stomach doesn't need that oxygen right now, but your muscles do. And so your working muscles receive a higher percentage of the body's blood than they would during rest. <coughs> Hopefully you can see this. So in this diagram here, at rest, you know, our muscles are getting quite a bit of oxygen and blood. Your heart's getting a bit, skin's getting a bit, brain's getting quite a lot, kidneys, liver, a lot. This is kind of a dramatic diagram because your brain is obviously still, still getting quite a lot of oxygen and blood. But um, you can see that our muscles will suddenly take up like the majority of the blood. Um, so more blood will be going toward your uh, your muscles during physical activity because this this muscles the muscles need that oxygen at the moment to work aerobically. So they'll be wanting to break down um, carbohydrates aerobically. And so remember that the breakdown of carbohydrates aerobically means you've got glycogen being broken down to glucose and you've got uh, glucose being broken down to pyruvic acid and then actually producing hydrogen, uh, sorry, not hydrogen, um, water, 
uh, carbon dioxide and heat as opposed to those hydrogen ions and lactic acid. So uh, make sure you understand that concept.